Hello, and welcome to today's webcast brought to you by Compliance Week and Series. I'm Kristen Sermon with Compliance Week, and I'll be your host today. Today's webcast is addressing climate as a systemic risk for financial advisors. Before we hear from our presenters, let me review the agenda. We are scheduled to go for one hour. After the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. Your questions will be kept confidential and anonymous, so please don't be shy. You can ask your questions at any time using the Ask a Question function on the left-hand side of your screen, and I'll pose them to our guests at the end of their presentation. After the q and I'll wrap up the webcast. This webcast will also offer CPE credits for all attendees. Be sure you're using either Google Chrome or Firefox as your internet browser and you have disabled your pop-up blockers in order to ensure access to the exam. Once I have signed off and the webcast is completely over, the final examination will be presented automatically in a separate window. If you have trouble viewing the CPE test or receiving the CPE certificate, please send an email to webcasts at compliancesweek.com. Once again, to ensure receipt of your CPE credit, please be sure you're using Google, Chrome, or Firefox as your internet browser. If you've missed anything, I'll repeat these instructions at the end of the webcast, so stay tuned. A few other administrative details. At any time during the presentation, listeners can download the slides from the drop-down menu on the left-hand side of your screen. There you will find the feedback form for the webcast. We welcome your thoughts as we're always looking to improve your experience. If you wish to increase the si slide size, you can also hit the View Slide Full Screen button at the top right of your screen. And lastly, a Help button is located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen for assistance. And I'd like to welcome today's speakers. It is my pleasure to introduce Linda A. Lacewell, the third superintendent of the New York State Department of Financial Services. We also have Allison Heron Lee, who was appointed by President Donald Trump to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate and sworn into office on July 8, 2019. I'd also like to welcome Vina Ramini, She's the author of the 2020 series report addressing climate as a systemic risk, a call to action for U.S. financial regulators, and is the senior program director of Capital Market Systems. And we also have Stephen Rothstein, the founding manager director of the Series Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets. It's great to have you with us, and with that, I will turn it over to Stephen. Great. Thank you. Kristen, to you and to all of your colleagues at Compliance Week, we really appreciate the opportunity to partner with you and to everybody who are joining us today. Thank you for your time. We know how busy you are generally, but especially these times, appreciate your, your joining us. Um, just briefly, Ceres is a nonprofit. We're a sustainability nonprofit. We've been around for over 30 years, working with investors and companies around the world on a host of global sustainability challenges from climate and water um, and deforestation and other issues. The um, Series Accelerator is a group within Series that's focused on systemic capital market issues. Um, and we, we're, we're excited to get into a deep conversation with our really incredible uh, panelists today. Before I do that, just a few minutes. First is um, our hearts go out to everybody. These are hard times. Um, and for any of you who, in your personal family or your network, that are facing challenges either because of the pandemic, uh, those of you who, again, either you or your families working on the front lines to keep us safe, we deeply appreciate that. We also recognize the pain that's being inflicted uh, through the systemic racism that exists and manifestation manifests in many ways. And third is the, the uh, extreme weather and climate change that we've seen, whether it be in the fires and smoke out west, the, uh, the, the, the tornadoes, the hurricanes. So these are challenging times for all of us and, and appreciate everyone being here and all that you're doing and hope everyone is safe. Um, as uh, I, I won't go through the instructions that have already been gone through, which appreciate that, but one thing I do want to emphasize is question answers, that there is, as Kristen said, 
there is opportunity for you at the uh, left side to add, to write in questions. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. Um, while the three women that are speakers, they're all extraordinary. I just want to add a sentence or two about each one. I could spend the rest of the hour just talking about them, but then obviously we wouldn't get to the substance of this, and their bios are all available online. But um, first, um, Linda Lacewell, who is, as was said, is the third superintendent of the New York State Department of Financial Services. So they manage and supervise the 1,500 banking and other financial institutions with assets of over $2.6 trillion, as well as 1,800 insurance companies with assets of over $4.7 trillion, um, and is a valued member of, of Governor Cuomo's cabinet and really appreciate all that, that she's doing. Um, on the federal level, Commissioner Allison Lee from the Securities and Exchange Commission, she brings lots of experience, over two decades of experience, as was, was, was mentioned, and she has written and lectured and taught courses and has spent over a decade at the SEC in various roles and really appreciate both of them. I also want to recognize my colleague, Vina, that I'm, I'm humbled with to work with every day. Vina is the report that I'm going to just talk about in just a minute, is the author of this and appreciate that, but she's also written many other reports at Ceres and is a, a, a senior program director there and has done so much great work. So appreciate all three of them for joining us. If we can um, go to the next slide, please. And my computer. Um, so uh, the report that we talked about, again, there's a report, there's a link in your information and we're happy to follow up with it, came out in early June, talked about uh, the systemic risk. And we've identified in here 50 recommendations for federal and state financial regulators. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. One of the underlying assumptions is that climate is a systemic risk. And we go through in extensive detail with the report has over 225 citations talking about that. So that means it's not just a risk if you're in Manhattan when Storm Sandy came or in San Francisco when the, when the fire is there. Uh, it obviously is for those. But if there are three types of risks, um, and the next slide, please, there is physical risks the fires, the floods, the tornadoes, um, the hurricanes, that were, uh, the droughts that are being faced across the country. Uh, and those are real and growing. I won't go through the statistics, but we are, all we have to do is open up the newspaper, watch the news to see the impact of that. Um, the second type is the transition risks, that as, as our economy moves to a lower carbon economy, um, there is a significant risk there. And just in the last few months, there's been over $35 billion written off by uh, just three oil companies alone um, based on, on the changes. And that means there are bankers, there are insurance companies, there are investors, that that $35 billion will be lost. That's just a, a, an example of, of a bigger piece. And then there are legal risks. So climate is a systemic risk that is affecting all parts of our society, uh, all sectors of our society, all, all geographies. So, and there's a, there's, an op there's a chance that if we don't make dramatic changes, um, we have to, we could lose in one in four trillion. When we look at these changes, if we go to the next slide, please, um, what we did to put this report together is we didn't just talk to environmentalists, we really talked to regulators. We looked around the world and there are regulators um, central bankers and the, and the equivalent of our Securities and Exchange Commission and state banking commissioners, where countries that have those, uh, that have been taking leaders, leadership. So there is, for example, the network for the greening of the financial system that has 69 members, including New York, which we appreciate. Um, but there are central bankers from, from Europe and Asia and Latin America that have really taken these positions. So all of our recommendations are based on what the regulators are suggesting in other parts of the world, not just what environmentalists are suggesting. And while we have dozens of recommendations, there's four broad ones just to kind of uh, uh, kick off the conversation is first is that climate is a systemic risk um, that should be looked at in the context of financial markets. And just like our, our distinguished guest today, regulators at the state and federal level, they do a great job looking at all kinds of risks 
and to ensure we have a stable and healthy market system. As we think about our economy, our banks, our insurance company, uh, Ceres believes that insurance that that uh, climate is not fully addressed in those risks. So to address the systemic risk and to build that in. Um, then the second is to build it into prudential supervision, and and it's from training bank examiners, looking at how stress tests are done, scenario analysis. There are literally a few dozen specific areas. Um, an area that the SEC has been uh, clearly active in is in mandating climate disclosure. I know that Trisha Lee is going to talk about this, and she has has spoken widely on this topic, including had a very articulate and thoughtful piece. And I, 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 if you haven't had a chance to read it in yesterday's New York Times editorial page, um, I encourage you to take a look at that. And then to coordinate with others at the state and national and international level as well. So if we go to the next slide, please, the report, and I'm not going to go through the details of this, goes through several agencies at the federal and state level and has specific recommendations for them. Um, that's, that's in there that we hope that all of you uh, engage with us and we'd like your opinions. Again, those of you on the call, your questions today, but we'll also share our emails later and want to engage and get your thoughts on this. So since June, next slide please, there's been a lot of momentum. Uh, first is a group of investors got together. Uh, they collectively represent over a trillion dollars of assets and they submitted letters supporting these recommendations and urging fast movement. Then you'll see here on the slide, the top is the House of Representatives, their climate committee. They came out with a, a significant report on many topics, but included nine recommendations dealing with financial regulators. Then the Senate in August came out with their recommendations uh, as well. They have a whole chapter on financial regulators that very much mirror the work of this. And then the next slide, just a few weeks ago, the Commodity Future Trading Commission came out with their recommendation, very detailed, 53 recommendations, 52 about the um, uh, financial regulators, one about the price of carbon, um, looking at that. So there is a lot of momentum building in these areas. So today's um, webinar is especially uh, uh, relevant and timely in, in, that in that context. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to um, Commissioner Lee and ask a, a, a few questions is do you consider climate change to be a systemic risk and uh, let me start with that one uh, Commissioner Lee and thanks again for joining us thank you Steve it's it's a pleasure to be here and I, I do want to commend series for that um, that report that that um, was put out recently it's very thorough and and well thought out and and much appreciated it's a nice it's a nice guidepost for us so, so let me let me just not bury the lead here and say yes, I, I do think climate change presents a systemic risk to financial markets, and I'm not alone in that regard. Uh, you know, the Network for Greening the Financial System, the Bank of International Settlements, Task Force on Climate Related Disclosure, and now, as you mentioned, the Market Risk Advisory Committee to the CFTC, just to name a few, have made a similar assessment. So let me drill down just a little bit and explain. Um, there, there are a lot of ways of, various ways of defining systemic risk. There's no kind of universally accepted definition, but broadly it's characterized by a couple of dominant features. Um, let me describe them first. Shock amplification or the notion that a given shock to the financial system could be magnified by certain forces and then propagate widely throughout the system that propagation, of course, can cause an impairment to all or major parts of the financial system. And finally, that impairment in turn causes spillover effects to the real economy. So I do think that climate change risk has the potential to trigger that chain of events. And here's why. Um, systemic shocks are much more likely when asset prices don't fully incorporate the relevant risks. As you mentioned in this case, it's physical risk, transition risk, and liability or legal risk. There's, and there's certainly evidence that climate risks are currently underpriced, especially with respect to utilities, but also more broadly. And that, of course, can lead to an abrupt and very disruptive repricing as markets begin to figure this out. So that could be triggered by massive climate-related events, like you mentioned, or significant changes in legal requirements 
that could just render assets or even business models obsolete in a very short time frame. And then secondly, these risks and shocks can spread throughout the system in ways that are both expected and in ways that are less pre predictable. So, for example, if or more likely when insurers pull back from insuring certain real estate, if you think, think coastline properties, that will affect mortgage lending and other real estate exposures in the banking sector. That's sort of a predictable or obvious way that climate risk could spread. But climate risk is also fairly unique in terms of its scope, its breadth, and its most importantly, its complexity. Researchers have called climate risk a, something they call a green swan event, which is different from its better known counterpart, a, a black swan event in some significant ways, but most notably in its complexity. So it's a new type of systemic risk that involves interacting, nonlinear, and fundamentally unpredictable environmental, social, economic, and geopolitical dynamics. These, these climate-related risks don't operate in isolation. They interact with each other, meaning the physical and the transition risks interact with each other in ways that compound their joint effects. And then, of course, climate-related risks interact with non-climate-related risks and vulnerabilities, like, for example, the historically high levels we're seeing now of corporate leverage and the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic that has depleted household wealth and bank balance sheets and created more debt. So climate-related shocks can magnify these vulnerabilities and vice versa. And in addition, of course, climate change itself is potentially irreversible in terms of the damage that it can cause. And so all of that in my view, increases the possibility that of an overall shock with systemic implications. Um, that's very powerful and uh, appreciate your drilling down and into that issue. It's very, very helpful. Can you talk, uh, is your, your special seat uh, as a Commissioner of Securities and Exchange Commission, you've talked and written about ESG and climate change disclosure and are a strong advocate for this clearly. Can you explain to us why you think this uh, climate disclosure is so important in the financial markets and what's happening now or kind of what your, what your thoughts are on this? Sure, so, you know, it, it, the SEC is not the first agency that comes to mind when you think about climate change and, and, the, and the problems that it implicates, but it, it should be, and, and here's why disclosure that's our bread and butter, that's what we do at the SEC, um, it, which is just information, is fundamental to investors' ability to assess price, um, or excuse me, to assess and price risk. And it's, and it's also fundamental for the shift that needs to occur toward an orderly transition to a green, sustainable economy. Now, disclosure alone won't accomplish the second piece, the shift, that's not in our wheelhouse, but disclosure is the first fundamental building block for getting there. As I said, it's necessary for accurate pricing and it's necessary for driving capital. And there's little question at this point that climate risk, as well as other ESG risks, as you mentioned, are material to investors, meaning important to them in, in their decision-making process. And how do we know that? Because investors say so, and we shouldn't be second-guessing that. They've been repeatedly clear on that point. We have petitions for rulemaking, recommendation from our investor advisory committee, um, you know, unprecedented campaigns for more disclosure like Climate Action 100 Plus and You All It Series published your report highlighting the need for better disclosures. BlackRock has basically said that climate risk equals investment risk. And SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, estimates that some 93% of U.S. equities by market cap are exposed to material financial impact from climate change. Again, calling it a systemic risk that can't be diversified away. We've seen more and more evidence of the link between broader sustainability factors like climate risk and financial performance. You know, we see analysts at some of the largest financial institutions referring to ESG as the best signal we've found for future risk, exceeding sometimes traditional metrics like return on equity and, and earnings volatility. So it's material to investors. And then the next question is, what is the current state of disclosure? What we have now, of course, at the SEC is a broad-based requirement for companies to disclose material risks. But that broad requirement hasn't really resulted in the kind of disclosure that investors need. 
I mean, disclosure on climate risk has definitely been improving due to mounting pressure from investors for voluntary disclosures to supplement the SEC's mandatory regime. But unfortunately, voluntary disclosure still falls short because it's spotty. Not everyone does it. It's not standardized, even among industries or sectors. It's not consistent period to period, even at the same company, and it can lack reliability because there's no requirement for an audit or third-party verification. Sometimes we see these kinds of disclosures being prepared by a company's PR or marketing department instead of through kind of more traditional disclosure channels. And I want to add here, um, and this is an important point, this organic demand from investors and, and data gatherers is putting a real strain on companies. They're trying to respond to multiple and sometimes competing demands for information from numerous sources, and it's led to something I've heard called survey fatigue. I mean, it, it can be a real drain on their resources, and, and that's why I think, at least in part, we're starting to see a kind of tipping point right now with public companies that are beginning to support a uniform, standardized set of disclosures because it can simplify their approach to the issue and kind of put everyone on a level playing field. There's been, there's been, as you know, a lot of great work done by organizations like TCFD and SASB and many others in helping us move towards standards for disclosure. But the final step, I believe, needs to build on that, leverage that work, bring everyone to the table, issuers, investors, other market participants, to come up with the best regulatory approach. Um, and then just to bring it back around to systemic risk again, you know, disclosure is the avenue through which we can best ensure that assets are accurately priced and we move toward an orderly transition of capital. And that is how hopefully we can avoid that systemic risk from materializing. Great. Well, that's, that's very thoughtful. And, and you generate a lot of excellent points. Actually, some great questions are already coming in. So I'm going to encourage you to keep those questions coming in. I'm not going to get to them right now, but but do recognize they're coming in. I'm now going to turn to uh, New York Superintendent Lacewell and just ask you, um, your agency is really is the first U.S. banking regulator to join the Network for the Greening of the Financial Systems, and you've had some big announcements, including last week on the insurance side. Can you talk about your decision and what's led to your great leadership? Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you to Ceres and to Compliance Week. And uh, of course, it's a pleasure to be with uh, Commissioner Lee and to Vina Romani. And congratulations on that report, which I think really frames the issues very well and importantly is clear and concise and to the point in what we need to do uh, to start to make a difference here as regulators. Um, so look, I came into uh, office last year, early in the year, and quite naturally, you look at what the priorities of the agency should be for the times that you are in. And some of them were easy, consumer protection with, unfortunately, the CSPB walking away from its fundamental mission to protect consumers, innovation because the waves of innovation are sweeping through all parts of the financial system for all of our institutions, especially our community banks, um, cybersecurity, which uh, is a tremendous risk for government and industry everywhere. But what I found had been absent from the ordinary dialogue uh, for financial regulators was exactly this topic of climate change. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, no financial regulator in the United States has really been able to officially take up the topic and embrace it and do something about it. And so uh, we really had to look across the pond, as they say, uh, to our peer financial regulators in Europe. Uh, late last year, I, I went with my banking head to Europe and met with the Bank of England, Banque de France, and other regulators, European-wide regulators in Frankfurt. And we talked about what the challenges were that we all faced. And this was front and center. And the Europeans, unfortunately, the regulators, are years, years ahead of us. Years ago, they brought up this topic and they put out a report and they said, we've got to grapple with this. And they're far down the road to understanding what the risks are for their licensed entities. Uh, what is the risk? If you don't know the risk, 
can't measure the risk, you can't mitigate it, um, and you can't look at your portfolio of investments and understand what your transition plan is going to be and how you're going to be affected by the transition risk that exists when others move away from assets, particularly carbon-based assets. Uh, and if you're not doing anything, you're left with the stranded asset, and what does that do to your financial strength? So as a regulator responsible for um, the safety and soundness, as you said, of companies holding you know, in excess of $7 trillion in assets, and as the regulator of insurance for the state of New York, one of the biggest you know, insurance markets in the world, it was imperative that we do something. And meeting with the regulators in Europe uh, helped me to understand that it was possible as a financial regulator to get educated about this, get engaged, get the right team, start to engage with industry, and that there were a number of you know, anticipated steps that you could take. Uh, that's why we joined NGFS, the first state or federal financial regulator to join. No federal financial regulator is in the Banking Climate Change Global Coalition, which is kind of outrageous. Uh, and we also joined the Sustainable Insurance Forum, which is the insurance side of the house on, on uh, uh, global regulators um, dealing with climate change for insurance. So we joined both of those, and the reaction we got from our European peers was they were extremely excited that at least somebody in the United States was stepping into this breach. And look, I know it's complicated. <clears throat> I know it's not easy. It's not easy for these companies. Uh, it's very complex. How do you measure your risk? Um, people are still trying to figure that out. But as our governor likes to say, denial is not a life strategy. And um, we are getting fully steeped in this um, so that we can help our industry to move forward um, because, you know, we don't have any choice, right? Climate change is accelerating, 10 hottest years ever recorded, all since 1998. This year, expected to join that. Um, the cost, the financial cost from climate-related disasters, from these billion-dollar disasters, more than quadrupled from the 80s to the 2010s, uh, over $800 billion in costs. And who's picking up that cost, by the way? A lot of it is the insurance industry. So they've got to pay attention. For property insurers, it's both sides of the balance sheet. They're picking up the costs on the liability side. How are they investing on the asset side, and are they doing anything to mitigate the risks of their liability. For life insurance companies that are holding premium dollars, you know, for decades, they've got long-term investments. Where are they investing that money? Are they investing in assets that folks are going to move away from because of their climate uh, change risk profile? Are they being smart about it? Are they investing in a way that can both help their own financial portfolio and will reduce um, the exacerbation of climate change impact. These are all extremely important questions, and you only have to turn on the TV to see the fires, not just in California, but to see 10% of Oregon residents at risk of having to evacuate, and the fires getting more intense and more frequent and raging further and further up into the wine country, causing devastation. You know, climate change is not the future. Climate change is now. The financial risks are now. They've got to be identified, measured, mitigated, disclosed, and we've got to have a plan for helping our industry to grapple with these problems. We can do it in partnership, and uh, organizations like NGFS help us to do that. Uh, that's great, and and um, we're very we really appreciate both your leadership, your team's leadership, um, all the the question each of the questions you've asked just now. They alone could deserve literally their own webinar, and and looking at those areas, both on the banking and the insurance side. But uh, I, I do want to ask. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of conversation in most of the countries. Obviously, you visit with, they have primarily or in some cases exclusively just a federal system. And so what do you see in, in, in the role in the U.S., the role of regulators at the state level, or put it another way, you know, 
tell us more what, what you're doing and what you think some of your colleagues can do. And if you want to mention, feel free to, the, the announcement from last week of some of your initiatives, feel free to do that. Thank you so much, Steve. Yes. Well, look, especially in the absence of, uh, of federal official leadership actually doing something instead of moving in the opposite direction, the states have got to lead because uh, there is no time to wait. And when it comes to insurance, the states are the primary regulators, so all the more so there. So during Climate Week, we were very pleased to make a series of announcements. One is that we sent correspondence to all of our licensed entities, uh, domestic and foreign, as they say, insurers, and we told them they were going to have to start integrating an assessment of the financial risk from climate change into their entire business structure. So that means their govern governance frameworks, their risk management process, and their business strategies. And that they needed to analyze uh, the impact on their investments, liquidity, operations, and certainly reputation and business strategy. Um, and do so on a proportionate basis. We have global insurers and we have little mom and pop insurers in upstate New York. Each entity should do that proportionately. And we also urge them to start thinking about uh, disclosure paradigm, uh, leaning on the task force for climate related financial disclosures and any other relevant initiatives because that was the direction that we were going in. We're gonna start looking at climate change questions as part of our examination process starting next year. We also joined uh, and were accepted as a member of the UN Principles for Sustainable Insurance, which is critically important and sends a very strong message and will further strengthen uh, our foundation to deal with these questions. And then on the business side, we also signed an important memorandum of understanding with NYSERDA, which is the Energy Research and Development Authority for the state where we're going, to, we're going to accelerate new, innovative insurance and financial products to help support the development of key low carbon uh, technologies, which are critically important in this market because they need insurance support and protection as well, particularly because they're new. And I wanna also mention, uh, and as you say, this could be a whole other uh, uh, topic of, a, of, a, of an event, we can't overlook the fact that, unfortunately, climate change disproportionately affects um, communities of color, consumers generally, but particularly of color. And uh, environmental justice, environmental equity, and looking at how we make sure that we protect everyone and not just some, and that we lift everyone as we try to move forward in mitigating these risks and helping to protect our people We've got to make sure that we look at those who are ultimately affected the worst and the most negatively. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. No, those are all excellent points and, and appreciate them. Um, let me turn uh, to my colleague, Vina and ask kind of a, a two-part question. One is feel free to respond. There's so much that's been said, but there's something kind of that you feel really important to talk about now, including any environmental justice issues or anything. And then two, you know, the report was released in the middle of the pandemic, the same week as, as George Floyd and everything else. What Tell your perspective of what you've seen so far, Bina. Uh, great, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, I will say that uh, since the release of the report um, in June, um, we have had over 100 meetings with financial regulators We've spoken with, I believe, all the financial regulators that we've highlighted in the series report, um, as well as a, a number of state financial regulators as well. And, and this tells me a few things. One is that this, this issue that we're talking about, this, this intersection between um, the role of financial regulators and, and climate change posing a systemic risk, that, that intersection is it's, it's striking a nerve with folks. The, the folks that we've spoken to in all these meetings the, the staff um, and, and leaders of some of these regulatory agencies, these are some of the smartest economists, lawyers, and policymakers in the world. Um, tremendously hardworking folks that are clearly also dealing with the global pandemic, but um, they are seeing the, the same studies and trends that we are seeing. They're seeing their global peers step up, as, as Superintendent Lacewell mentioned. They, see, you know, they, they too look across the pond. They are 
seeing the action that their global players are taking on both individually and collectively on climate change as a systemic risk. They're also seeing the growing leadership from um, state level and regional peers. And to that end, I cannot overestimate the importance of the step being taken by the New York DFS and Superintendent Lacewell. This offers a testament to what we need to see financial regulators do um, and, our off and offer a template to actually what can be done. So, so practical steps, concrete steps like this are, are tremendously important. And, and again, I, I really do want to applaud the New York DFS um, for this incredible um, step that they took last week. Um, the second point that I want to mention is that um, there's more happening under the surface than meets the eye, particularly research. So a, a number of federal agencies, um, including the, the Fed, the FHFA, um, the, that's the Federal Housing Finance Agency and others, are in fact conducting research conferences. A number of them have um, hired staff on these issues. They're starting to have internal conversations. These internal conversations aren't leading um, to, again, to, to policy decisions, to regulations as fast as we would like, at least um, at the pace that we've seen demonstrated by the New York DFS. But, but some of those conversations are, are starting to happen, and I, I do want to recognize that. Um, I think where what I see as a bottleneck is the unfortunate politicization of climate change in the U.S. in the sense that this is unfortunately seen as a political issue, and because it's a political issue, it, it is seen as something that needs to be solved by policymakers in Congress. Um, that is clearly a part of what needs to happen, but this is where, again, the, the leadership, the, the, the public statements on these issues from, from you know, the, the, the leaders on this call, from, from Commissioner Lee, from Superintendent Lacewell and others, reiterating that whether or not climate is, is political, whether or not climate is environmental, it is also fundamentally a financial issue, and a financial issue that poses threats to the very stability of financial markets um, is critical. And, and to this end, in July, series um, co coordinated with a group of investors, with businesses and others, um, and released a statement which was, at the end of it, signed on to by 70 plus groups, including investors representing a trillion dollars in assets, affirming that climate change is a financial issue. And given, that, given its systemic impacts, it belongs on the mandate of financial regulators. So essentially calling on financial regulators to do their jobs vis-a-vis um, -vis the systemic risk of climate change. Um, you also asked me a question, Stephen, about, you know, to what extent does the pandemic um, affect what needs to happen in terms of the role of regulators um, and climate change? Um, the reality is that irrespective of the pandemic, we are seeing the impacts of climate change play out as we speak all around us. You, you talked about the wildfires in, in the West. We've seen the hurricanes um, in the South. Um, we've seen many, many impacts um, really um, come, come home around us. I, I mean, I think this is proof that climate change isn't an issue that somebody can deal with at some point in the future. The, the impacts are upon us. The, the, the reactions also should be happening in real time, much as the impacts are playing out in real time. Um, globally, we have seen jurisdictions like, like Canada um, actually making connections between climate change and their economic stimulus packages. So for instance, um, Canada, as a part of the, the recovery loans being provided to large companies, has linked, uh, included a, a requirement to um, climate change disclosures, as Commissioner Lee so eloquently described. So much of this needs to begin with disclosure. You, you can't make smart decisions at, at the company level, um, at the investor level, at the portfolio level, or at the regulator level without having the right information and, and really getting um, reliable, consistent, useful information from issuers on climate change is the place to start. So let me stop there. Um, thank you, Dina. That's, again, there's so much there that we could talk about that's, that's very, very helpful. Um, let me ask all of you a question. When you think about um, if you had to pick one either agency, it's obviously your own, um, uh, or one area that you'd hope to see change um, to, ask, to ask you, what do you think that would be? And for uh, Commissioner Lee, how have you seen collaboration with other federal agencies in this? And for Superintendent Lacewell, how have you seen communications with, with other state agencies? So Commissioner Lee, I'll start with you and then go to Superintendent and then, and then Vina from you. Thank you. Um, I do. I want to start by just echoing um, 
uh, Ms. Romani's remarks about Superintendent Leswell and the leadership of the New York State Department of Financial Services. Um, it's just been very heartening to see. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with the, uh, everything she said, including her views regarding the, um, the, the need for more federal official leadership in this area. Um, so thank you for your leadership on that, Superintendent Leswell. And um, so the, the wish list, like what, what would be the one thing, you know, that I would like to see? There's really kind of two things, um, but, but, the, but the core, as I said before, is disclosure. So what I, would, what I would most want to see is a collaboration. You know, we should, we should I would like to see us um, initialize a task force internally at the SEC to uh, conduct, you know, a lot of reach out to investors, to, to issuers, particularly issuers, because they're the ones that are going to have to do this disclosure, um, to market participants and others, and begin to build up what, what, a, what a mandatory regime should look like, um, you know, what the core components of it need to be, because that is really the, the foundation for all of the information that needs to flow through the system. And it's true that it's only public companies uh, at the SEC, but I think um, private companies could benefit from this as well because it, it would be a, a guidepost for them that they could also use, that they could point to and say to their investors, we're doing what is required in the public markets and um, you know, let that kind of serve as a baseline. So that would be my, my sort of first point. Secondly, of course, I think we need to look pretty closely at the asset management industry and help them get the information they need to make sure their investments are performing in the way that they um, that their clients want. So they too need this information because um, their clients are, you know, give them very specific instructions about the types of investments they want to make. And for them to be able to carry out those instructions, they need accurate information. So two, two pronged answer there. And uh, on the collaboration piece could not be more important. Um, I think, again, given the discussion around systemic risk, FSOC is a good place to start having some of those discussions or, you know, they're having some of those now, but I, I would like to see more fulsome discussions at the level of, of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. And um, uh, with that, let me, let me stop and turn it over to the next one. Great. Those are very helpful. Superintendent Lacewell? Thank you. And Commissioner Lee, thank you so, so much for your kind remarks. I, I really was I really want to congratulate you on the op-ed that you did uh, in the last few days, which, which I had the opportunity to read online. Um, uh, I look, if the pandemic shows us nothing else, it's how connected we all really are, not within the state, but the country and globally. And everything that we do affects each other. And within this country, uh, the fires out west, the smoke drifted across the country as a visual, visual reminder um, that we are not in silos, we are not alone, we are interconnected with each other. So we work very closely with the Federal Reserve, for example, in our, our supervisory uh, oversight of institutions in common, and we have a wonderful relationship uh, with the New York Fed and the Federal Reserve generally and with the FDIC. And I would like to see us very quickly get to a place where that can encompass also the financial risks from climate change and what we can share and discuss together about how to incorporate that into our supervision. I would like to see a Federal Reserve which is empowered and liberated to talk about those issues, which I believe they would very readily do. So I look forward to that day. Um, but these crises are interrelated. You have a public health pandemic, then you have the fires out west, and you got to evacuate. So what does that mean? It's not safe outside, stay home. It's not safe inside, get out of the house. They're connected to each other, and our world is increasingly complicated. And, uh, you know, there are multiple um, risks within the financial system, but also the public health pandemic, um, the economic crisis, the cry for racial justice, climate change, these can all interconnect and stack up on top of one another and generate damage and harm that we didn't even really consider uh, unless we got a risk model to run it through. So um, my wish would be that all of our financial regulators can be empowered to work together because 
it is going to take all of us. It takes all the regulators, state and federal and foreign, and it takes the public sector, it takes the private sector, it takes insurance industry, it takes publicly traded companies, it takes the citizenry, it takes really all of us. Thanks, Steve. Great. Well, that's definitely a great wish and uh, I um, agree with you. Vina, do you have comments on this? There's a lot of audience questions, sure. but want to give you a chance. Yeah, and, and maybe um, I can talk to this somewhat briefly. I think my wish, Stephen, has a slightly lower bar. And, and the, the, what I would like to see is financial regulators at least make that affirmative statement, recognizing the systemic risk of, financial, of, of climate change, um, and, and make that statement now. And the reality is um, we need um, financial markets to start pricing in climate change, and, and we need to have that happen, you know, years ago, right? Like, we need to have that happen yesterday. Um, rulemaking takes time. Action by financial regulators takes time. That's something we, we clearly recognize. But even an indication from financial regulators, from, from, again, folks taking a page from what the New York DFS have done, uh, and seeing that played, played across across the, the regulatory ecosystem, if nothing else, would send what I believe is a very important signal um, to companies um, and to investors about um, what is to come, which will hopefully precipitate uh, prudential action in the short term. Great, great. Well, again, we have many audience questions, and I encourage you to continue to submit those. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so the first one it references something Commissioner Lee says, but I'm going to open it to anyone who wants to add. And I made myself. Um, as Commissioner Lee noted, climate change could prevent an abrupt repricing of assets. But do we have the tools and analytics good enough or precise enough to adequately begin the process of repricing assets like real estate with climate risks along current understanding of materiality and fiduciary responsibility? Um, I have some comments on this, but let me first see if either uh, Commissioner Lee, Superintendent Lakefield, if you want to add anything on that comment, on that question? Um, sure, I, I can start. This is Commissioner Lee. Um, so, so do we have the tools? Uh, you, you know, the answer is it, it's very complex, as, as Superintendent Lakefield noted. And so it needs to be an iterative process. And part of the, part of the potential public disclosure process will be that, will be an iteration back and forth, not just between the users of the information and the providers of the information, but also among the providers so they can learn from one another. But, and, and in the UK, for example, they're preparing to publish some open source models for how to model kind of the forward looking risk. That's, that's the difficult part. I mean, the impacts part, the sort of greenhouse gas emissions and that type of thing is not quite as complex, but clearly the forward looking piece of it where they're trying to figure out how to best model and gauge risk using scenario analyses and the like. I don't think anyone thinks that's gonna just roll right out perfectly and everyone will know how to do it exactly right the first time. But I do think we have to get started. Um, and, and again, I think it's gonna be an iterative process and we will learn through that process, both from issuers learning from one another and then learning from the users of the statements. Great. Uh, Superintendent Lacewell, do you want to add anything on that point or should we go just, on to the next question? Uh, just very briefly, I just, it's going to take the innovators out there to really help us. This is an area where we could, we could use um, the smart thinkers out there who are inventing new products and services to focus on this issue to help the regulators and uh, industry to be able to deal with this question. Absolutely, and, and we have a lot of them in this country and a lot in New York in terms of innovators. I think, you know, we have only a few years, according to the UN, before there is irreversible changes, and we're seeing that more and more every day, as we've talked about. So we, this is not one of those initiatives that we could make progress slowly and still feel we're going to make progress, because making progress slowly is not enough. And what we've seen is over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years, there's been great advancements in voluntary disclosure. So there's more information out there now, continues to get refined. And it's only been refined, as both of you have said, by people stepping forward, innovating, and then having feedback loops, as there is just as FASB gets updated on a regular basis. So I, I completely agree. Vina, do you want to add anything before I move on to the next question?
Okay. No, um, it, was, it was covered. Thank you. Okay. Um, n- another question. In our urgency to express climate issues and financial regulation, how do we do this at a pace that allows financial service companies to meet stakeholder interest in a meaningful way? Happy to anyone who wants to answer that. Uh, well, it's uh, it's Linda Lay. So why don't I go first on this, and then uh, others can jump in. Um, disclosure is a very important step. Um, I think my sense is the difficulty is, uh, and I think uh, Commissioner Lee alluded to this uh, in her earlier remarks. If it's voluntary, not everybody's going to do it, and you get mixed information. And from all perspectives, not just markets, which is, uh, you know, an issue, but um, adequacy and richness of information, it's it's not going to be it's not going to be adequate. As a regulator, for example, on insurance, we can move to a place where um, we help industry to disclose, so that there's a level playing field, and nobody feels like, well, if I go first. I'm at a competitive disadvantage. So I do think it's going to take regulators, supervisors, and others to um, pull industry into the land of disclosure. So we anticipate we'll be doing that on the insurance side. Um, and you know, uh, obviously, we've got our whole banking side as well, where there are a lot of similar issues that uh, we're going to have to turn our attention to at some point in the near future. Um, Stephen, may I jump in on this as well? Please. Great. So, so um, I think that there are ways to frame regulation where um, regulators can work with the industries that they supervise to um, sort of combine um, reg- prudential supervision with education. So again, um, again, uh, Superintendent Lesfold can probably talk to this in, in much more depth than me, but um, banking regulators, you know, engage with the companies that they supervise on an ongoing basis. So again, a, a lot of what um, some of these financial regulators could start to do is is start to engage with con- um, with the financial industry in particular, both to you know get a sense of how the financial industry is starting to address climate change as a part of their risk management systems, as well as you know do do you know provide knowledge sharing, provide um, ways for peers to learn from each other, ways for best practices um, to be shared, so that again there is a, a collective sense of a, a moving forward in a in a way that's um, coordinated and together rather than top down. But um, again, given the urgency of the issue that that faces us, and and given the time frame for action, um, some of that needs to happen right now. Great. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, it's Linda Lacewell. I think that's exactly right. We are in continual discussion with um, both our insurance and banking sector and their associations. And what we plan to do is to bring folks together uh, in sort of a learning exchange model where each of them can share their experiences of how they've moved forward or what issues they're grappling with. We don't pretend to have, you know, the answers from on high, but we know that um, some of the sector have moved forward and that there are standard setting organizations that can be helpful and we can look to the experience uh, you know, in England and, and France and the Netherlands, for example. That's Great. right. This is this is Al oh, sorry. Really, I'll just let me just throw in that this this to add to what Superintendent Lathwell just said about uh, from on high. You know, it has certainly been suggested that uh, folks that that um, are, are supportive of of regulatory overlay in this area should suggest a framework and, and or a solution. And I agree with that, but that really cannot be kind of a pronouncement, a regulatory pronouncement from on high. It needs to be exactly what we've been discussing, an iterative back and forth process, a collaboration. I think the trickiest part when it comes to identifying what ought to be part of a required disclosure regime is to ensure that we have one that can grow and change with uh, with society, with the science, with the investors' needs, and that's 
you know, that's why the standard setters like SASB and, and so many others um, are, are extremely helpful. We should be building on their work. But I do think we're going to have to make sure that we have a, a kind of a living, breathing structure because this issue is living and breathing and we need to be able to stay on top of it. We can't just issue a rule and then let it sit, you know, and, and expect it to work well for, for, you know, 20 years into the future. But, Absolutely. You know, those are very important. Um, we're not going to have time for all the questions, but let me ask one other and see if we get some comments. There's a question from someone, one of our, our listeners is saying, is, do, do we believe or any of you believe that investors are now foolish in their assessment of risk, that they're not taking, uh, you know, ignoring some of the climate change warnings uh, and, and how will these changes help them? So, uh, Commissioner Lee, if you want to start, and, and Superintendent Lacewell. Sure. Um, so, you know, investors are, are leading the charge in this space. Um, they are the ones who, it's their money, uh, and they're the ones who are kind of, uh, you know, leading the charge to try to get the information that they need. And in fact, you know, the, the, the kind of these, these reports that we see companies putting out now annually, um, just thousands and thousands of pages of voluntary disclosures, that's unprecedented um, in, in, in modern history in terms of, of investors just basically going around, and, uh, going around the SEC and saying, I need this information. So I do not regard them as foolish in their assessment of risk. I regard them as somewhat handicapped um, in, in their assessment of risk, and I feel like we need to uh, get in there and assess. Great. That's a great perspective. Uh, Superintendent Lacewell, do you want to add anything on this point? Uh, just add, look, at DFS, we put consumers at the center of what we do because every decision we make affects real people, uh, as we say, individuals, families, small businesses. And uh, I think Commissioner Lee was pretty clear that in, investors are at the center of the SEC as an interested party, and um, it's their money. Uh, and if they're leading the charge, all the better, because they know what is material and important to them. Great. Excellent. Um, Vina, I'm going to turn to you for a final word before we wrap up. Yeah, and the only thing to add on the investor point, sorry, the only thing to add on the investor question is that um, it's worth noting that um, the leadership from investors around climate change is coming from investors of all kinds of shapes and sizes. So, so clearly the, the faith-based investors, uh, the mission-oriented investors have been talking about these issues for years, have, have really, um, you know, led the charge. But certainly over the past five, six, seven years, we've seen large mainstream asset managers get into the, the fray. I think everyone on this call is probably quite familiar with now the annual tradition of the, the, the BlackRock CEO, Larry Fink's letter, where they talk about climate change as being an investment priority and an investment focus. We're seeing, again, similar statements from other large asset managers, public pension funds, um, asset owners, et cetera. So the, the investment community has certainly woken up to the risk that climate change poses to their investments and are, in fact, um, agree with everything that um, Commissioner Lee and Superintendent Lee both said about really leading the charge in, in trying to have um, the financial risk of, of climate change um, assessed and, and priced in. Um. Thank you, Vina. And again, I, I, um, I, I appreciate all the questions we received. Well, there's a few that we didn't get to. We'll try to follow up uh, offline. But want to thank first our two uh, public servants that are the model of service and that our country is better off because of the work that each of you are doing in your respective areas. And you both have remarkable staff that we have the opportunity to work with. And Vina and all that my colleagues at Ceres, climate change clearly requires a, a all of us to work in different areas. So really appreciate that. And to each of you who are listening, thank you. And we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Uh, my only sadness is we didn't have more time. But with that, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Kristen to wrap up from Compliance Week. Kristen, back to you. Yes, uh, thank you so much for a very informative session. Again, everyone, our speakers today were Superintendent Linda Lacewell, Commissioner Allison Heron Lee, Vina Ramini, and Stephen Rothstein. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Ceres for making this webcast possible. 
Once again, to obtain your CPE credit for this presentation, please disable your pop-up blockers in order to access the exam. The webcast will automatically close and the final examination will be presented in a separate window. If you have trouble viewing the CPE test or receiving the CPE certificate, please send an email to webcast at compliancesweek.com. And this webcast has been recorded and is available later today to Compliance Week members on our website under the webcast tab, which also contains a library of additional CPE webcasts. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member, please contact us at info at compliancesweek.com. For today only, we invite you to use code WEBCAST365 to receive a membership for just $1 a day. Check out compliancesweek.com slash membership to learn more. This concludes our webcast. Thank you again for joining us, and goodbye.